Colorado's Republicans cheer the official nomination of Donald Trump, whose vice presidential pick has something in common with our state's most prominent Republican. They directly blame President Joe Biden for the attempt on Trump's life. We begin our in-depth series, Decision 2024, The Stakes for Colorado. Tonight, a look at what Trump's immigration policy would mean for people living in our state. Colorado's most vulnerable Democrat in Congress really doesn't want to say whether she thinks President Biden should stay in the race. The president is running his race. I'm running my race. Um, I hope that Colorado voters see the difference between those two. And a look at a massive new shelter in Denver for teenagers without a place to call home. That's tonight on Next. Former President Donald Trump is having one of the best days of his political career, just two days after he survived an assassin's bullet. A judge he appointed tossed out a case that could have got him convicted again by Election Day. This afternoon, Colorado's 37 delegates joined the overwhelming roll call at the Republican National Convention to nominate Donald Trump for president. That our delegation, with unity and purpose, while responding to our president's call to fight, 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 unanimously votes for the 45th and soon-to-be 47th president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. That man there is Colorado GOP Chair Dave Williams. Have not seen much of him since his primary night blowout loss and the loudest calls yet from other Republicans for Williams to resign as state party chair. Republicans on the convention floor in Milwaukee today chanted, Fight! echoing the words of former President Trump in the minutes after he narrowly avoided being killed at that rally in Pennsylvania. Trump's running mate announced this afternoon, not a surprise, not today at least, but as Donald Trump was emerging on the political scene years ago, now Ohio Senator J.D. Vance was highly critical of Trump as dangerous and unfit for office, potentially America's Hitler. Vance even saying that somebody would have to be an idiot to vote for Donald Trump. Well, times change. And now J.D. Vance is joining the ticket with Trump. He reinforces their MAGA base and echoes Trump's populist message. Following the assassination attempt on Trump, notably, it was Senator Vance and Colorado Congresswoman Lauren Boebert who were among a small minority of Republican leaders at the national level who said that President Joe Biden was personally responsible for the assassination attempt. So now that Trump is the official Republican nominee, we are going to spend some time each day this week taking an in-depth look at the impact of his plans and proposals on Colorado. We'll do the same with President Biden and other candidates and issues between now and November. In the case of Trump, we will be relying on what he has said publicly that he'll do in a second term, as well as what's written in his official campaign platform. We'll be looking at the RNC's official platform, as well as the governing blueprint put together by Trump allies at the Heritage Foundation. Project 2025, a 900-page policy plan meant to be the foundation for the next Republican president. This is Decision 2024, the stakes for Colorado. Tonight, our Angeline McCall looks at Donald Trump's immigration policy. Over the past two years, a wave of immigrants at the border created an issue voters want answers to heading into the November election. On day one of my new administration, we will shut down this travesty and defend the wealth of hardworking middle-class families. Former President Trump is promising to tighten the border, terminate work permits, and start mass deportations, citing as many as 15 million people who could be removed. Trump has even said he'd use the National Guard to round them up. I like what President Trump says he's going to do, mostly because it revolves around enforcing the laws that are on the books right now. Supporters, including Douglas County Commissioner George Teal, say they believe local law enforcement could actually enforce that detainment and deportation. The federal government has the resources to execute such a plan. Our state um, has state level assets that could participate in that. But then, yeah, our local law enforcement, I think uh, they're the ones that will provide that key on the ground knowledge in order to help for a successful execution. <laughs> that is impossible. Violeta Chapin is an immigration attorney and professor at CU Boulder. And we haven't been able to locate all of them in the two, three decades that they've been living here. Um, and so to think that we could somehow, you know, find and deport more um, is, uh, is not logistically practical. I mean, we, the immigration legal system is notoriously backlogged. So we don't have the infrastructure to process all of those people through our legal system. Backlogged, not only for newly arriving migrants, but for long-standing immigrants, including DACA, 
advocates fear could see an end under a Trump presidency. Trump tried to dismantle it in his first administration before the Supreme Court blocked it. If you abolish DACA, you're basically penalizing children of people uh, that came undocumented. But those children are no other choice. They had to come with their parents. MSU Chair right. of Economics so Dr. Alexandre Padilla says the plan Trump has come up with would cost taxpayers. Sending back people is extremely expensive because you have to put them in planes and you have to send them in planes back to their own country. And it would cost talent. And so you would lose, you know, good employees, uh, maybe long-standing employees who had authorization to work, but now through no fault of their own, they've lost that authorization to work. Teal says DACA isn't necessarily what voters are concerned about, though, when they think of immigration. The people who uh, I meet on the street here in Castle Rock or up in Highlands Ranch, they're all in favor of legal paths to immigration. But Trump has talked about limiting options that are considered legal and totally legitimate. We will terminate all work permits for illegal aliens. Experts know Trump, if reelected, will find it easier to control border policy than to enforce interior enforcement, such as detainment and detention. Critics say the policies he wants to implement ultimately will reflect a merit-based immigration system. We do want a merit-based immigration process because right now we have we don't even have that and it certainly is sort of an an a pro-rich anti-poor system which is not american in my opinion and is not something that we should be saying that we are as a nation they should be in their country this is not sustainable but so back in 2016, Trump tried to implement several similar policies. However, many were met with obstacles and challenges in the higher courts. Seeing that there is now a conservative majority in the Supreme Court, many of those judicial challenges may no longer be a roadblock if he is reelected. And I think that's one of the challenges anytime you try to parse what Donald Trump says he's going to do, because sometimes he says things that are just hyperbole. But in the case of his immigration policy, it's laid out pretty specifically what he says that he wants to do. And it truly would be a deportation unlike the United States has ever seen. So it would take an entirely new type of effort to pull that off. Yeah, I mean, certainly we'll see, right, if that kind of enforcement level is possible, right? Uh, you know, Dr. Padilla said something interesting to me in the interview. He said, uh, you know, there are messages, right, to sort of get voters on board. And then really realistically, what does that mean? And so this would be unprecedented levels. And like uh, Dr. Violeta Chapin said, that, you know, this would also be realistically impossible. So you have two different sides of the aisle kind of trying to figure out what will come to be. All right. Angeline McCall. Thank you very much. There were roadside safety signs in the 1950s that read, drive carefully. The life you save may be your own. A reminder of personal responsibility that acting responsibly keeps everyone safe, even ourselves. The idea that our fates are both individual and intertwined. That while yelling at other bad drivers on the road may be satisfying, the single best thing that we can do is drive safely ourselves. I've thought about those road signs and those reminders as I've heard people in recent days talk about political violence in America, heard politicians who stoked political violence themselves now condemning political violence, as if we all aren't traveling down this road together, as if their words and their actions didn't contribute in some way to the horrible place we've ended up, a place that is both surprising and predictable, impacting everyone's safety even their own. Now, I want to be clear, the blame for the attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump lies with the shooter. Former President Donald Trump did not deserve to be a target of political violence because no one deserves to be a target of political violence. Not him, not the people targeted after his own rhetoric or the people mocked by him after they were attacked in acts of political violence. No one deserves to be a target of political violence. Our politics may be divided, but we know that our safety is intertwined. The sign got that right. The road we share demands that we all drive carefully. After dodging our questions for weeks, Colorado's most vulnerable Democrat sits down to talk about President Joe Biden's fitness for office. Not quite sure we got anything like an answer. And a new shelter, more than 100 beds for young people without a home. It's almost ready to open its doors. Next.
Democrats' dilemma, whether President Joe Biden should stay on the ticket, given concerns among Democrats about his age and mental fitness, that dilemma impacts Congresswoman Yadira Caraveo personally. She's the most vulnerable Democrat in Colorado's congressional delegation. She has said very little about what she thinks about Biden's future for weeks now. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger had the chance to talk to her, ask the congresswoman every which way, and I still can't tell you what she thinks. Congressional Democrats had a call with President Biden this weekend. Congresswoman Yudira Caraveo was on that call. What was your message to the president? Did you tell him he should not run for re-election? You know, I think the president made it clear in that call and in uh, various other interviews um, and various other venues that he is not stepping down. Um, and so I think that the question of whether he should continue to be president is really up to Colorado's voters. Well, you're a Colorado voter. Do you think the president should run for re-election? The president is running for re-election. He is um, our nominee. Um, and so we will see what uh, every other Colorado voter has to say in November. You're stating a bunch of facts, but do you think he should be the top of the ticket? And I'm going to get to why that's important for you, particularly in a moment. But do you think he should be the top of the ticket? It really doesn't matter what I think, uh, Marshall. He is the top of the ticket. I don't think that um, what I say is going to change his mind. Democratic Congressman Jason Crow was also on that call with Biden and told the president he has concerns about polling and perception. Last week, Democratic Senator Michael Bennett told CNN former President Trump could win in a landslide and take the Senate and House with him. Caraveo won her eighth congressional district two years ago by only 1,600 votes. If what they say comes true, you're probably out of a job. So should President Biden stop running for re-election? I think that, that the question of whether I should keep my job or not is going to be something that uh, I frame to Colorado voters about me, not Biden. Mr. Biden is, has his uh, race to, to run, and I think I have a record uh, that is distinct from his that I hope uh, Colorado's voters in the 8th District will take into account no matter who they vote for for president. I mentioned this last week. The district that is Weldon Adams Counties, which is the 8th Congressional District, is half unaffiliated, 25 percent Democratic and 23 percent Republican. So perhaps there is interest in her answer, Kyle. I got to say, the Congresswoman is going to be asked a lot of difficult questions about a lot of difficult issues in the swing district. I guess some voters may be OK with her, like, mystery position, don't really have a position here. But, like, there aren't very many issues that she's going to be able to squirm out of like that, you'd think. Right. Uh, this is a question I asked it four times in 80 seconds and got the same non-answer non answer. Uh, but there are issues strictly in a district that does split down the middle that she has to be more centrist in. And I guess of not giving a definitive answer on the top of the ticket. The concern really is if the top of the ticket is going to weigh down the rest of the ticket, that's when you might say something. That's what Bennett and Crow are saying. And that's the district that is going to impact the most. And I think the other disconnect is, too, like, we want to know what these folks are saying in private because we want to know what they believe because they represent Coloradans. And if they're really saying in, in, in private, oh, gee whiz, do whatever you want. OK, that's one thing. But if it's two stories, I don't know. I think people would like to know. Marshall, thank you very much. I want to bring Kathy Saban now to talk about the, the heat wave winding down as well as a new way that we're going to be talking about the weather around here. Kyle, we have weather just really connecting all of us and impacting us on a daily basis. So as the Nine News weather team chief meteorologist, I want to be the first to introduce you to some new graphics that are going to help us give you as much advanced warning of an impending storm or change and give you the information and news and, and just the information to make good decisions to protect your family. So if there's a weather scenario or storm that is dangerous, disruptive or inconvenient, one, two or three of these criteria, we are going to issue a weather impact impact day. And the graphics for that are going to look a little bit different. You will see us really hone in in detail on what the impact is. We'll have graphical displays to show you the timing, what the impact is in terms of severe weather, lightning, rain, and hail, and then some advice and forecast information on what you might need to do. If you see red bars on our forecast pages, like the three-day forecast or the seven-day forecast or a weather impact day alert, you do need to pay attention to that because 
because we're going to give you the information you need to make plans and preparations for what is coming your way. Meantime today, how about a break from the heat wave this afternoon? After 102 Friday, after 99 on Saturday, after 101 today, we are seeing beautiful scenes like this and scattered rain showers around the area. A shift in the weather pattern means not only a cooling trend, but a chance for rain from storms tonight, tomorrow, and Wednesday. We are currently 76 degrees in Denver after a high of 96. The biggest threat with these storms tonight will be wind and lightning, and a couple of these storms have the potential to drop a little bit of hail, so we're watching those pretty closely. But the best part is the beneficial rain that we're seeing, and we'll get a chance for seeing more of those showers in Denver overnight tonight and again tomorrow afternoon. These storms move out. Skies clear. We get a sunny start to the day. Foothill storms around 2 o'clock, cruising over the metro area between 3 and 6 tomorrow. Severe weather threat tonight will stay over extreme northeastern Colorado, and your temperature trend will be very comfortable for the next few hours, leading us to a cooling trend and a high of 83 on Wednesday, upper 80s, low 90s for the rest of the week into next weekend. Denver's about to have a lot more room, quite literally, for young people without a place to live. They call it the Mothership, a dormitory-style shelter for teenagers without a place to live in Denver. Project of the nonprofit Urban Peak, offering not just shelter there, but additional services like mental health care and a medical clinic. And it's a really stunning view. It's just another space to engage in healing. Christina Carlson, and I'm the CEO at Urban Peak. You know, we have seen the growth of people experiencing homelessness in this community, and we have seen it in the youth population as well. So we're at the Mothership, and this is our new campus, and we'll be providing comprehensive services for 136 youth. Yes, we're doing inspections, so it's loud. Trauma-informed design is meant to really be that partner in healing. So this is one of the dorm rooms. Really think about how light and space and how high the ceilings are and the natural environment, how that really provides that beginning of healing and that coming into the space feels really welcoming and beautiful. We work with the most vulnerable who many times are in this position because of their family environment or because of the systems they've been involved in. The best way to think about the neighborhoods is they're kind of like a college suite. So you have shared community, full kitchen, but we'll also include all kinds of support services from education, employment, workforce development, medical clinic, behavioral health. And what we really want to do is wrap those services around them so that they have the opportunity to not only build those trusting relationships with appropriate and safe adults, but also really support that moment of healing and community and allow for the space to grow up. Wonderful organization that you've supported in the past through your Word of Thanks dollars. Hey, we are back with a word on the good you're doing in rural Colorado. Marilyn, thank you. And your feedback, next. I want to thank you for your generous support for the Family Resource Center up in Sterling in Logan County. Between your weekly donations to your latest Word of Thanks microgiving campaign and the monthly recurring donations to the Word of Thanks Fund, you've raised about $25,000 to help that small nonprofit help the low-income parents and kids in their community build healthy futures together as strong families. Your generosity has touched every corner of our state, and I'm always looking for your suggestions on where we can help in your community. So please email me. Next at 9news.com. Lori says, I'm dismayed to find next devoting significant time to national presidential election topics. Please give us some respite. We'll try not to repeat what you hear on the national news, but we are going to focus on how those policies would impact our state specifically.